and I'm going to officially start recording, so I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to start in about a minute. I um, uh, just wanted to make sure that your volume is tested right and stuff, and, and we're going to, if you uh, see a little chat box down in the lower part of your thing, um, to the, your screen stuff on the side, uh, there's a question box as well as a chat box. You can type things in there during the time I'm going to be um, determining which part goes to Peter, which I'll answer myself, and uh, which we'll save for Q&A. So we promise to answer pretty much everything. But it's 7 o'clock, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's USA Volleyball um, great webinar. I'm really looking forward to this because we've got the amazing Peter Vint on. Um, on the edge of human achievement. Now this this started because of uh, Peter and I share a lot of ideas back and forth. Um, and those of you who don't know Peter, I think probably the most insightful thing you can do is go to prepvolleyball.com, um, type in Vint, or go look at the uh, thing about the myth of wrist snap, which is a topic that he and I have done several times, including at the ABCA convention. And we excerpted the myth of wrist snap out of the 25 or so myths that we see in volleyball into the uh, Volleyball USA magazine. And then Peter had to deal with um, someone who was basically saying that uh, he was full of baloney and demanded a public retraction and, and couldn't believe you know this kind of stuff was going on. So to know how Peter is, you'll see in prep volleyball that the way he very professionally answered it with uh, with tact and, and diplomacy, that befitting of the Olympic uh, motto, and <laughs> things like that. But we really are lucky to have Peter Venn on because not only is he a you know, high performance director for the U.S. Olympic Committee, but he's a longtime volleyball person. And I don't know, Peter, why don't you tell him about that little short pass before we get started on your slides? Sure. Well, hi, everybody. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to be joining you tonight. I really appreciate the invitation, John, to to do this with you and, and share some of these thoughts with you. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'll, I'll share a bit of my background with you. Uh, I think particularly as it pertains to, to volleyball, but then a, a bit more in terms of where I've come to be where I am now. Um, I started playing volleyball at the invitation of a high school PE teacher who saw that I was really trying to take it seriously and was having fun playing. And she invited me to uh, to join some of her um, college friends and uh, others that had a USAV club team at the time. Uh, quickly joined that, fell in love with the game, and and like most things that I do, was pretty OCD about it, and fell head over heels in love with the notion of doing everything I could to to play and become better. Played collegiate club ball. Uh, take that for what it's worth at Northern Illinois University. Um, there in my senior year, ended up volunteering my time with uh, the NCAA Division I coach. And at the time, uh, that was Pete Waite. He had just stepped in, and it was a great experience. We got along terrifically and uh, spent a lot of time around the game there with him. Went to University of Delaware for my master's in biomechanics and met Barb Vieira and played both on the club team there and assisted with her. And then ended up uh, later on at Arizona State University where I met both Jeff Nelson and Patty Snyder, later Patty Snyder Park, and joined their coaching staff at ASU as, as a volunteer graduate assistant and then was introduced to the world of junior Olympic volleyball uh, through Jeff Nelson and coached for probably a total of seven years, I think, with Arizona East Valley juniors. Uh, and along the way, I think probably starting in 1990 or so, really in earnest began working with or or trying to work with USA Volleyball and contributing things that either I knew or I thought I knew in a way that could help let me share what I loved and and what I was learning with coaches and, and those that were trying to make the sport better. And I think as I've gone along over the years, I've, I've learned how to be um, much more appreciative of the things that coaches go through on the court. Um, but I've also been willing to challenge both myself and coaches to be better about the application of, of science and sometimes technology. Uh, John and I then have found a, a real kindred spirit in the former 
and that is I think we're both very much uh, advocates of best practices and really trying to uh, find practical ways for coaches to better understand the science that they can feel more comfortable using it on the fields or on the courts to help their athletes improve and and understanding the nuances of the real world environments that everybody works in and so uh, the presentation that I'm going to give you today actually and, and John you can chime in a little bit on this if you'd like but um, this actually came from a presentation I was asked to give for the United States track and field podium education sessions which happened this last November uh, sorry December in Virginia Beach and ultimately it's a presentation uh, that won't be anything at all about volleyball specifically but we'll start off telling some stories about human performance and particularly elite level athletics but ultimately gets to the place where we can talk about things that really make a difference and things that we can do to either adopt best practices or ensure that um, some basic things are in place so that we can avoid catastrophic failures uh, at all cost. And, and I'll end the talk with actually talking about some things uh, that are related to a, uh, an interview that I participated in on a blog, a guy named Dan Peterson, who runs a blog called Sports Are 80% Mental. And the blog relates to the, the question of nature versus nurture and uh, I'll share some of those thoughts with you because I think that they fall very much in line with some of these ideas and, and I think are, are very much in the spirit of, of what we're going to talk about tonight. John, do you have any thoughts of I, again, why, I, why or, <laughs> or no, what, what might have prompted you for, for this particular talk? Well, it's because it, it has because everything matters, and you're going to see some insights that uh, will be subtle and yet at the same time, I think, important to our sport on the, the things that really matter. So without ver further ado, let's get going because uh, we've got a lot to cover. Uh, sounds great. I, I'd like to just start with the caveat of, of realizing again that this won't be volleyball specific. I'd encourage you to try to make it as specific as you can to your um, your athletes and, and your coaching style, but ultimately this is about big picture performance things. So I want to start with with this slide, and we'll have a couple of these, and, and I just want to introduce this as it's kind of the world that, that I work in, uh, and the world that a lot of coaches work in at the Olympic and, and elite levels. Um, this is actually taken from a uh, a Sports Illustrated layout and comes from uh, the photograph itself comes from the Nagano Olympic Games in 1998 and the quote here I think is just a blast uh, the difference between eating on a cereal box and being a, or eating from a cereal box and being on one is just spectacular but the backstory on this particular race is even more substantial oh, you back John <coughs> the um, back to the uh, the ski race this is the men's 4 by 10 kilometer cross-country ski race. And the two countries represented here are Norway and Italy. And over the course of three successive Olympiad from 1994 forward, uh, these two countries had such a bitter rivalry that over 75 miles of racing and over five cumulative hours of racing that the total difference over three successive Olympic Games boiled down to less than one second. So over 75 miles of racing, the, the difference in the cumulative time between these two countries was less than a second. It's just remarkable in terms of how competitive this is. Next slide. Since John jumped ahead and was <laughs> up here, you, you saw that. Uh, this is, of course, Michael Phelps, and this is his seventh uh, Olympic gold medal in Beijing. Uh, this was in uh, the 100 butterfly where he out-touched uh, Milorad Kavik by 0 .01 seconds. That was the, the shortest recorded time that they could actually come up with. In the end, and through a series of analyses, it was revealed that both athletes were seen to touch the wall at the same time, that, but in fact, Phelps actually out-pressured 
uh, Kavik to win. And so it was not when either of them touched the wall, but rather how rapidly Phelps applied pressure that actually boiled down to this. And so uh, he went on to set, obviously, a, a record of eight gold medals, breaking uh, Mark Spitz's former record of seven, and this is the seventh. Next slide. This last slide is, is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I use it a lot. This is from the 2007 World Championship in Osaka. This is the women's 100 meter final. And uh, here we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven athletes uh, finishing within an unbelievably close margin. In fact, the three medalists uh, are finishing within uh, a hundredth of a second, which is simply spectacular. Uh, the, I bring this up to show that, you know, as we look at performances like this and, and the previous two examples, um, things are so close and things are so tight and the levels of achievement are becoming so comparable that the challenge often for us becomes asking the question of where performances are ultimately going. And John, let's go to the next slide. Because I'll introduce the concept here, and again, this is in the context of track and field, but you could easily apply this in the context of jumping or the ability to, to strike a ball hard and generate ball speed. But, but ultimately, in the example that I'm showing here, there have been a number of mathematical studies from uh, biomechanists and economists and statisticians that have shown that in many competitive events, the levels of human achievement appear to be plateauing. They appear to be reaching an asymptote. And this is work by uh, Professor Mark Denny, who is uh, a Stanford professor. In 2008, he published a paper um, looking at, ultimately, the limits to running speed in horses, dogs, and humans. And what he found is that in women's events, uh, women's running events, uh, many of those appear to have plateaued, even though, as you see here, there are some variances around these trajectories uh, that, in fact, the performances aren't improving. In this particular example, where we're looking at men's short events, here his analysis actually demonstrates that it hasn't none of these performances have truly reached a plateau. They still are incrementally improving. But you can see that the rate of improvement is unbelievably small. Uh, the variance around this indicated by the, the real best annual performances in the dots uh, you know, bounces around these fit lines. And, and, and that simply indicates kind of the envelope around which performances are expected to lie. By the way, that pink dot in the upper right corner is Usain Bolt's performance in uh, the Beijing Olympics. Let's go to the next slide. Now, these are uh, these are Denny's results as well, uh, uh, results as well, and here again showing now that women's events uh, over the same same distances as we just saw in the men's have in fact reached a plateau, and. What this means is that if performances have reached their peak, that, um, that humans can only achieve a certain level of performance uh, beyond which the results are simply random, what does that actually mean in terms of performance and how you coach and what you talk to your athletes about and how you prepare them? And ultimately, this slide here, this what if it's true slide, uh, was the question was whether you ultimately believe that humans have reached their potential or not, or whether they're capable of doing more or not. Let's assume for the rest of the presentation that, in fact, that's true. So whether athletes are maximized on true jumping potential or their ability to read a play, uh, if everybody can do the same, or at least you know that the peak levels of achievement are fixed, then what does that mean for you as a coach? Let's go to the next slide. And ultimately, we're going to come back to the 2007 women's race, and we're going to look at this a little bit differently. Let's go ahead and click one more, John. So 
from the case of looking at this from from the way that I do oftentimes, and that is very analytically, the the performances of any of these athletes could be represented, and here they're they're done with kind of a cartoon. Let's go ahead and click one more time, John, or two more times. Uh, ultimately, the the performances of any given athlete on any dimension of performance, and here it's actually the outcome. Uh, can be represented by the mean value and the variance that the athlete demonstrates around that mean. And so, again, if we put it in the context of volleyball, if this is vertical jumping ability or the ability to place a set at a consistent location, then any given dimension of performance will have an average value that the athlete can currently deliver and, of course, the variation that goes along with that. Let's go ahead and click one more time, John. And I'd say right now, Peter, that that kind of also ties into some of the stuff that Hugh has brought forward so well at the last couple of HP clinics about risk management and where our targets should be for passing and where we should be aiming for setting and variations on a theme um, with my yeah, ability so to deliver a ball. That's right, and, and so you know, let's let's go ahead and stop just right here for a second because, uh, John, that's an important point. And one of the things that just from a, a purely analytical perspective that you can think about as a coach is that what you would like to do on any given dimension of performance, particularly the outcome, is to make the average better, whether that's faster, whether that's more consistent, whether that's higher. Whatever you're doing as a coach or as a trainer, ultimately on the dimension of performance that you're working on, you are working to both make that average better and you are looking to reduce the athlete's variance on their ability to execute that consistently. So what that means is that any one of these curves, you take it and you would just shift it to the right and you would narrow it, squish it together so that the variance is now uh, smaller, narrower, the, the band of likely values is within a, a, a more narrow range. So let's go ahead and collapse this, John. One more slide. And now we've taken that, you know, those, those simplistic representations of each athlete, now we've just dropped those all down. Uh, the green lines, of course, represent the finish locations. And if you look at this, what you see is that any one of four athletes, mathematically speaking, could have actually won a gold medal. Uh, and in fact, all but one of them could have won one of the three medals that was available. So when this is what we're dealing with, when the level of the winning performances is known, and the level of winning performances can be achieved by many athletes, then what in the world matters and, and what can you do about that? So John, let's go to the next slide for the very obvious answer. Oh, I guess we're just putting this in context for first. Yeah, that's just to show uh, the, the value here and, and how rapidly that's all happening. Let's go ahead and jump ahead uh, to the thing that John actually alluded to when Things are so close and things are so competitive that literally any little thing could contribute to the difference between finishing first or finishing fourth or finishing seventh. What matters? And the answer is everything matters. I've pressed it. So, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. There it is. <laughs> there it is. So let's go ahead and jump to the uh, the next one. That that wasn't meant to be such a sophisticated. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next one. A very exciting slide, of course, but uh, it, it's really meant to be a placeholder to remind me to to interject a story. And the story that I want to tell you about is is one that I came across earlier this year, and and it's told by a guy named Dr. Atul Gawande, and he is a surgeon and he is the author of three of my favorite books. Uh, he also writes for the Washington Post, has a blog, all kinds of stuff. But Dwayne Smith, he tells the story of this actually in a, uh, a speech that he gave to Stanford graduates. Uh, and he was describing this guy named Dwayne Smith, just your average 34-year-old 34 34 year guy, his wife, you know, job, a kid. Um, and a few years ago, he was involved in a near-fatal car accident. 
So Gowani tells the story that the accident left him with a broken leg, pelvis, broken arm, both lungs were collapsed, he had uncontrolled internal bleeding. Um, he was flown to an emergency trauma center where the hospital's uh, emergency room went to uh, went into action. They stabilized the fractured leg and pelvis. They put tubes in both sides of his chest to re-expand his lungs. They gave him blood and they got him to the operating room fast enough to remove the source of the bleeding, which was a ruptured spleen. And they did all of this under tremendous pressure uh, in, in literally life and death situations. Uh, Smith ended up in the intensive care and he was in the hospital for three weeks. He recovered and he ended up getting through all of it. And the clinicians had done almost everything right. And Mr. Smith, as told by Gawande, uh, is still deeply grateful for everything that was done to save his life because he's still a husband and he's still a father and he still has a job. But they missed one step. The physicians who saved his life forgot to give him a vaccine that every single patient who has their spleen removed gets. And it's a vaccine that actually fights the bacteria that the spleen ultimately handles. So he's alive and you know a few years later he ends up uh, going on vacation with his family and on this vacation he ends up picking up some strange bacterial infection and nobody knows what it is uh, but ultimately it is a, an infection that was caused by a bacteria that his spleen should have otherwise handled or the vaccine should have handled. Uh, he was rushed to the emergency room again. His fingers and toes were amputated because of gross swelling and, and blood constraint. Uh, and he'd later tell the author, of course, that it was the worst vacation ever, and I can't, can't understand why. But I tell you this because it highlights two important things that I want to remind us all of. And uh, we'll go ahead and go to the, the next slide to start with the first. first of these is that we can be and should be better at more completely utilizing the things that we know to be true. And by true I don't mean, you know, kind of true or I think it might be true or it's true sometimes uh, or anything else. By true I mean really true. You know, it's always true no matter what, like, you know, giving the guy the, the vaccine that he needs to take care of the bacteria when you take out his spleen kind of true. That's what we mean. And uh, John, let's go to the next slide. Because uh, Gawande writes in one of his other books, this is actually his second book called Better. He writes this, I think, as concisely as I've ever come across. And, and when I read this, I stopped and I pulled it out and I've used it several times since. But he writes this, he writes that we have not effectively used the abilities that science has already given us, and we've not made remotely adequate efforts to change this. Now, we all know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of examples of this. Some of them we encounter every day. We know that washing our hands with soap and water reduces the spread of germs. I'm not sure if any of you heard uh, an excerpt on NPR this morning about the incidence of fecal matter on grocery carts. I'll spare us all the, the gross details of that, but uh, that of course happens because people fail to wash their hands after using the restroom. We know that brushing and flossing our teeth reduces the spread of uh, tooth decay and gum disease. We know that milk buzz, does a body good. Well, you can prevent forest fires. Friends shouldn't lend friends drive drunk and and now we know that we shouldn't text while we drive. So all these things that we know that have been proven to us and proven to be successful and, and uh, effective from science and medicine are available to us and yet we continue to make decisions that fail to put those things in place. And so I'm going to give you an example of one of the things that I find more often than not in the area of sport, and it's related to one of John's favorite topics, and that is um, skill acquisition and motor learning. If you have struggled through a motor learning textbook, you've inevitably seen slides like this, slides that are demonstrating the effect of blocked per practice versus random practice. 
it kind of looked like this, and, and I don't like looking at things like this. I want to share a simpler message with you. So John, let's go ahead and click, and I'm going to simplify this for us. Here we've got a task that on the vertical axis uh, we're measuring time, and in this particular task we measure fast times as being good or indicative of good performance, and slower times are indicated of uh, bad performances or poor performances. And we're going to have two different kinds of practice, and I'm sure that you all know what these are. Block practices are essentially drills that we do one thing over and over and over and over again, and then we go on to the next thing that we do over and over again. And then random practice, where we essentially do the same number of repetitions if we design the practice well, but we mix them up throughout the duration of the practice or even a practice week. So in classic skill acquisition modal learning literature, you see this kind of trend. This is a, uh, essentially a learning acquisition trend where in the course of practice and learning the skill, we see that block practice is consistent with good performances and regardless of where or when you start, they stay better uh, in terms of practice performance than random practice, always, almost always. But then when it really matters, when either the coach isn't there or they're not actually in the middle of a drill but they're in the middle of a game, then what we see is exactly the opposite. And this is probably one of the most important contributions that uh, Dick Schmidt made to the field of mode of learning, and that is putting in the retention test. Had it not been for the retention test, we would have never have come to the conclusion that random practice is in fact vastly superior to blocked practice uh, in more game-like or more real-world situations. Let's go to the next slide. Well, and I, I'm just going to interject. Um, when Schmidt and Erickson were out with us about two, three years ago with all the USOC coaches and you were there, I was stunned by the number of times some of our Olympic coaches were asking him, kind of wanting him to reconfirm or let him keep doing block training. And every time he was very consistent with his answer, he would answer, are you practicing for practice or are you practicing for performance? And that is really the most important distinction to make. And there are times, uh, there are times that there may be some motivational benefit to having a successful practice and that you just want the performance in practice to be positive and good. But in the end, you do so with the realization that you've done little, if anything, to facilitate learning or retained learning, which is the, the aspect of skill acquisition that carries on to be manifest in competition situations. Well, and I, that's a really good point, Peter. I think depending on your athletic director, if you're, you know, where you're coming from, if they're attuned to motor learning, they're comfortable with this, the chaos. What, when, uh, Peter, I know you weren't there, but when Q's group workout with the national team gals that were out for the HP thing went to much more game-like and, and random right fairly early after some block training, he kind of looked up at the crowd as things were flying all over the place and said, it's looking a little squirrely out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the, the really valuable thing uh, to, I think, have a conversation about is that um, that's, that's the reality. And, and in fact, that scenario is one that was brought up to me in a completely separate uh, situation. We had a group of uh, master's level coaches coming in for continuing education courses. And uh, this particular coach was an NCAA Division I basketball coach and said, look, I, I actually really buy into this idea. The problem is, is that if I design practices so that they are highly variable and highly random, and my AD comes in and watches my practices in the gym and sees it going on like this day and day and day, uh, that ultimately he asked me, what in the world am I doing? Why am I just letting these guys play? Or why am I not doing drills to make them better? And it takes a great deal of, of willingness to be able to help educate 
those that don't understand the value of this or why you're doing it. And, and certainly that applies also to uh, parents of club level coaches that may come in. They're clearly paying a, a fair chunk of money to have their kids uh, play club volleyball. And if they're not doing isolated drills, but are rather shanking balls because they're trying to serve at each other or, or they're uh, doing a continuous motion drill where balls are coming over the net at different speeds and they have to move and they're not great with footwork so they shank balls out over the place and can't accomplish uh, what you'd like them to. There's probably more learning going on there even though there's far greater rates of failure than there is success and it certainly looks a lot messier. And for you to, to be able to stand tall with both the director of the club as well as the body of parents that are looking at you like, what in the world is my kid getting better at? That was horrible. Uh, you have to be able to say, we're getting better at learning what it takes to solve this problem. And that's really the essence of, of the difference between blocking and management. Well, it, and that's well, very well said about the AD and the parents. I, I can tell the group that's listening in tonight that... Um, about a month ago, I gave my kids two one-hour motor learning sessions, covered a lot of this stuff, asked the parents to come, and some did, and really made a point to help them understand based on that, you know, like my blogs talk about the player who knows why beats the player who knows how. So they understood why we might be training differently than the coach on the court next to us or warming up a little bit differently the way... Um, uh, Rob Browning from the, our, you know, team leader from our 2008 team says to his 1300 dollars, we're going to lose the warm-up, honey, but we're going <laughs> to win the game because their warm-up is pretty random still, you know. So do you want to stay on the slide and cover it? or? Uh, well, I would anticipate that, you know, because... The, is there is there interest in the audience to, to have me cover this specific slide? Ultimately, it's another example, but it's a sport-specific one. Often, there's there's criticism of the motor learning work because it it wasn't really applied or designed to be applied in the real world uh, the way that we need it to be. Uh, but this particular study is actually a very good example of of this concept, and it and it demonstrates the principles uh, that the more controlled studies were designed around, I think, very clearly. So I'll go ahead and just describe it very briefly. And Peter, uh, they are saying yes, but one, Denise would like to know what the control line is. Which control line is that? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so let me explain the experiment here. This is a, um, a study of baseball batters. And we have three groups of college uh, collegiate baseball players that were broken into three groups. And uh, the first group was defined as control. They weren't going to get any practice uh, at all. Uh, a group that was assigned a random practice group. And in this group, they went to batting practice. And, and I don't remember the exact number of balls, but let's say it's 100. And of those 100 balls, they were going to get 50 curveballs and 50 fastballs from the pitching machine. And uh, the order of those balls was completely random. They didn't know which one was coming. In the blocked trial, they received the same number of 100 balls, but half of them were delivered. Uh, so let's say that the fastballs were delivered as 50 fastballs in a row, and the 50 curveballs were then delivered also all in a row. And so the order of them were always consistent and always the same through all of the practice sessions. Then we get to the transfer test, which is ultimately, you know, you take away everything else, and now it's how do you perform in the real world. Here, again, it was a, uh, an isolated situation where the, the pitching machine would throw at them either a random sequence or a blocked sequence of balls. They weren't told which one was coming, but ultimately would figure it out. And what you see is that, of course, the, the control group, the group that didn't practice at all, um, uh, was only modestly better than, than their pretest condition, uh, probably not statistically so, and performed far worse when they actually got balls delivered to them in a random order than in a blocked order when they were doing the test. Those that trained under a blocked condition showed exactly the same trend. 
But the, the most relevant thing here is that those that were training under a random condition, so they were getting those 100 balls on each practice session in a completely random order, did better than all groups in both conditions, both in the random test condition and in the blocked condition. And so realizing that, first of all, performances will never be blocked in a game like baseball or in volleyball, uh, that we can essentially take that condition out because it never occurs and we need to look more carefully at what specifically happens when we get random sequences of events uh, thrown our way and how will we respond to them. The answer is that if we've trained to essentially uh, experience that variability, then our ability to utilize information and act upon it more accurately and more quickly improves. And I will say that even in this controlled study where the delivery was given by a pitching machine, I would anticipate that in fact if this was actually given under game situations with a live pitcher, that the performance of the random would be even greater than it was here. And that is because the ability of those athletes to utilize perceptual cues and look at what specifically was happening from kind of the spatial temporal information that was presented to them would likely be enhanced as well. We can go to the next slide, John. Cool. Um, Chan. Did that answer anybody's question? Yeah. And we can a ask questions. The you know, afterwards, too, um, Chan wrote that uh, he picked up this theory from a uh, past webinar implemented throughout his practices, and he says, it does actually work. It just takes time to see the results. <laughs> yeah, it does. And, and let me just, uh, you know, before we get on to this, this next one, let me just say that this is common everywhere. Uh, I've been uh, consulting with a professional basketball team now for the past year, and I can tell you that they practice much as we probably all practice when we took uh, junior high, you know, or, or in, you know, tried to play basketball in junior high. They do the same drills over and over and over again. They take shoot arounds from six different locations, and they'll take ten shots at each spot. And I swear if they move from a dime, I would be shocked. They have assistant coaches passing to them uh, in exactly the same spot in that sweet catch and release shot zone. And they go around the horn, and then, of course, they do the 100 uh, free throws after practice. This is an NBA team. This is a division-leading team, actually, right now, uh, and, and one of the, the top four teams in the Western Conference. So. Lots of things uh, permeate through all levels of sport. And, and I'll say, too, that I just came back from the, the MIT Sloan Sport Analytics Conference in Boston. And I was talking to uh, performance analysts and performance directors from English Premier League soccer teams, guys from Fulham, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, uh, a couple guys from the Netherlands and Norway, who are experiencing exactly the same things as they have come from kind of a scientific background and try to apply or integrate these concepts into training environments, even the academy environments, they're struggling in, in uh, making these things happen. Uh, I did some work with the, uh, the development team of this particular pro team and, and introduced these ideas to their coaches and, and they actually loved them. They, they really were hungry for some information and hungry for things that they could do better and I gave them these ideas of, of variation and randomness. And uh, we integrated things like, for example, you never take more than two free throws in a row and you never take them with your heart rate less than 85% of maximum. And we introduced these basic concepts. We showed them that if you do these traditional shoot-arounds, that if you're putting the ball in a very precise location for them every single time and they're not moving in any given spot, then you're not doing anything that's similar to how they experience this in the game. And, and we showed them footage from games. And essentially, if you think of looking at a, a, the front view of a player, you could probably uh, make a uh, imagine taking 10, <coughs> ten dots and, and putting them almost all on top of each other around the right shoulder, and that's where 
players were receiving the ball in practice. But in the game, you take those same, same 10 or now 100 dots and you distribute them almost in an entire sphere around the player. So we introduced with them something called Bad Pass Friday. And it was funny because the guys initially would, would kind of joke amongst themselves saying that, hey, well, this is what we get from you anyway all the time, talking to their point guard. Uh, and, and so they made a joke that it was pretty funny. But later on, you know, the goal of this was to give players realistic but very difficult passes to collect and then shoot from. And one of the most telling things that I've ever encountered in person is that one of the guys uh, – was going through this. He just finished kind of catching a really tough ball, shot it off balance, made the shot, and walks away and he's saying to the coach, he goes, coach, that is a lot harder. And when that happened, I captured that on film. I took it back to the coach and said, this is what it's all about. This is problem solving at its best. When the coach uh, or when the athlete can tell you that that was really hard, but you know what, I figured it out, that's a really good place to be. So bad pass Friday. It's good for everybody. All right, so let's go on. Uh, this one, remember back to to uh, where we started here, right? We started back with uh, with Dwayne Smith and and the spleen problem, and so the first thing that I wanted to convey that we could do better was using stuff that we know to be true more effectively. And I would ask yourselves to really ask the question of what is it that I know is true? What is it that guys like John Kelsel have been telling me that I have yet to fully implement in my practices, and, and why is that? Okay, but the second thing is to realize that, in fact, in sports, bad things happen. And sometimes they happen because sports are fast and dangerous and complicated, and, and sometimes, you know, stuff happens. Uh, this, of course, is Dan Jansen. He was the, uh, <coughs> he was the best, uh, long track speed skater in the 500 meter and 1,000 meter distances in uh, 1988, where he promptly lost an edge, blew out in all races, and didn't medal at all. Uh, of course, we later found out that his sister uh, had a, a rare disease, or not a rare disease, but a disease, a leukemia, ended up dying later. In 92, he came back again being the favorite in the uh, 500 meters. He, in fact, had set the world record just months before the Olympic Games, and again, he catches an edge in the fall. And in 1994, of course, he finally overcomes it all, and he wins a medal, and it was great. It was a beautiful triumph of kind of the human spirit, but ultimately, here is this favorite who's dominating in world-level competitions for years, in fact, almost a decade. And yet, on the biggest stage in the world, he makes simple mistakes, loses edges, and falls. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, what's that one? Yep. Did we lose it? Oh, let's know. Since his sister, Jane, Sorry. passed away, he <laughs> promised her it went gold. Let's go to the next one. Right. <laughs> that one jumped for us, huh? Yeah. Let's see. Go. Right. The next one is uh, the the All Blacks. I uh, know we're up a little bit. You know, slide 19 there, John. <clears throat> this is the All Blacks rugby team, and uh, the All Blacks, of course, from New Zealand. Uh, they compete in rugby union, and they have been the most dominant team maybe in the history of sports. They have the highest winning ratio of any professional team on the planet. They've won 75% of all games played and have been ranked as the number one team in the world for almost every year that those rankings have been held. Only five of the top 20 teams in the nation have ever beaten New Zealand over the 100 years that they've played. It's, it's unbelievable. In 1987, the All Blacks won the Rugby World Cup. It was the first year that they held the, the Rugby World Cup. They won it, deservingly and, and not unexpectedly so, but they have not won it since. The World Cup is held like the Olympics and, and the World Cup in soccer every four years. 
and in 2011 it will be held in New Zealand and so they're freaking out they they have literally been spanning the globe over the past four years uh, telling their story and describing their post competition analysis to all the high performance programs all the best high performance programs in the world uh, of which I think we've been considered very fortunate to be included in that conversation um, but I can tell you that these guys do it right. They have an enviable uh, high performance development program and they have ultimately lost in the world's biggest stage because of, of fluke and circumstance and, and quite honestly because in a one and done tournament sometimes things happen. I mean we're, we're right about to go into March Madness here and it's the reason that we all love watching it. It's fun because sometimes a team that shouldn't have any business being competitive, in fact, beats a, beats a far superior team. So uh, next slide, John. Next slide is Bodie Miller, who I bring up uh, in the context of uh, here. <clears throat> of course, he was uh, a hero in, in Vancouver. He was a triple medalist. He won gold in the super combined, uh, silver in the super G, and a bronze in the downhill. Just an unbelievable Olympics. Uh, but he was actually hyped beyond belief in Torino in 2006, but yet didn't medal at all. And the interesting thing about Bodhi is that as you listen to his interviews in Vancouver, and people were asking him about the difference between his Torino and, and Vancouver performance, you know, clearly there was uh, there were many differences in his behavior, but ultimately the way that he tried to ski was very similar. In that, he said even in his success at Vancouver, that the important thing to realize is that to win at this level, you have to be winning. You have to be willing to fail, and by skiing so hard and so aggressively, uh, as the only way to potentially medal, that at any given moment he could have skied out. In fact, often does on the World Cup circuit. So for him, it was you know a, a total risk reward balance, but way way more on the riskier side. It just happened to go in his favor this time around. Let's go to the next one, John. So sometimes bad things happen just because performance is complex and fast, and and quite honestly because it's variable. And John actually is telling a story about his son. You know about you know if if performances are variable, remember back to the bell curves where uh, there is an average or or typical level of performance that our athletes demonstrate, and then 50 percent of the time around that average they do a little better, and 50 percent of the time around that average they do a little bit worse. And sometimes they do remarkably better, and and sometimes they do way, way worse. And we have to remember that that is just a part of human performance. This part actually gets into now the whole issue of trying to avoid the catastrophic failure. And that's a, that's a blog for everybody that's out there called uh, Stats for Players and Parents because it's trying to help the parents cope when they're playing below average. So, all right, you're up. Okay. All right, so sometimes, uh, again, <clears throat> Bad things happen because because of variability and because sports are complicated, but sometimes bad things happen that shouldn't happen. And this is uh, Matt Emmons, who is widely regarded as the best rifle shooter on the planet. He is a multiple World Cup World Champion medal winner, and in, I don't know if you remember, but in Athens he was uh, leading in uh, the, the three position rifle competition, this is the, the last standing round, he was leading going into the, the final round and all he had to do was shoot an eight, which for him was you know kind of like any of us trying to hit a barn, uh, but he crossfired and that is he actually shot into the next guy's lane and he instantly went from first the gold medal to eighth, the last person in the final because uh, that score registered a zero. So uh, that is a completely um, preventable mistake that happened by lack of focus or letting stress get in or, or something else. Let's go to the next one. 
This next slide is a picture of Billy DeMong and Johnny Spillane, who are two of the members of our Nordic Combined team, who I feel was, was probably one of the best stories of the Vancouver Olympics. But I bring this up because um, in 2009 at the World Championship in the uh, Normal Hill team competition, uh, Team USA was ahead coming out of the ski jump. They had uh, demonstrated great capacity in the cross-country ski leg previously. And when they showed up at the start line, Billy could not find his start bib, and the team was disqualified. So he later found his bib tucked in his, his, uh, tucked in his suit, but his team was disqualified at the time. And I've actually encountered this in beach volleyball where teams have stepped onto the court without their bibs and have forfeited an entire game because one of them have had to run back to the, the starter's bench and, and pick those things up. So the next slide. This last one was, I think, one of the saddest stories of Vancouver uh, to watch unfold because this is uh, Dutch speed skater Sven Kramer who set the Olympic record in the 10,000 meter long track race. He absolutely blew apart the competition. It was a beautiful thing to watch, it, just incredible. But he ended up also being disqualified because his coach uh, told him incorrectly with just, uh, just laps left to change lanes one too many times. Now, you know, in these three examples, and I'm sure that you could cite other examples where you know athletes have just bombed miserably, uh, and it's you, you know, and in some cases it's just dumb stuff. You know, I ask, you know, does this mean that you know the coach in this case was lazy? Did it mean that he didn't care or that you know he what didn't know what he was doing? You know, he's he's actually one of the best coaches in the world. And so why and how this actually happened is, is quite a mystery. It was a mistake, but it was a preventable mistake. So you know, what I know is that unnecessary errors happen. They probably always will. Um, but because they're unnecessary, that you know, we should find ways to make sure that they don't happen to us. If they happen to the other guys, great. But I think if we have a little bit of forethought and, and really try to address the things that could potentially blow up for us, then we can do ourselves a, a nice service and, and protect catastrophic failures. Uh, this is, of course, by Churchill. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. This is an, a very interesting slide to present to you today because uh, when I wrote this presentation for the first time, I was in London uh, for a, a conference and was actually watching the the Commonwealth Games unfold. And in the UK, there was a lot of press, a lot of media coverage about the deli belly, which was uh, essentially gastrointestinal discomfort that half of the Britain team and about 40% of the Australian team had experienced because of uh, dis, uh, sanitary conditions. They weren't washing their hands or uh, uh, filtering their water to the extent that they should, and some of their athletes that were favored to win medals actually failed to compete at all because uh, they were they were rendered incapable. Now I bring that up and brought it back to track and field to say, look, in 2011 we have the World Championships in Daegu, South Korea. It's going to be hot, it's going to be very humid, it's going to be really uncomfortable. They'll be exposed to food and other things that they're not used to. It would be as though any of us go down to Mexico uh, for a competition and uh, decide that we're going to compete. And if we don't have lessons or, or instruction about not to drink water or make sure that we uh, adequately cook our, our shellfish, then inevitably we're, we're just asking for trouble. And so sharing these messages back to these athletes and coaches to try to prevent the loss of unnecessary uh, medals is, is a really important thing. And again, it's one that we can all carry through, I think. Now, uh, at the time that this is coming, I can go to the next slide, John, that uh, there is another book by uh, Atul Gawande, who you know, clearly I'm, I'm getting a cut of all of his proceeds. but. If you haven't read him yet, he, he really has written some terrific things, and this last book,
book that he's written called The Checklist Manifesto is, is outstanding. And it lays out a number of examples where um, doing things that can allow performers or coaches or managers to, to take the dumb stuff off the table and let the brain focus on the stuff it needs to and not worry about the stuff that should be otherwise taken care of can be a really effective strategy to help us uh, avoid some of these errors. So again, highly recommend it. Let's go to the next one and, and we'll kind of get into the second part of this. How are we doing on time, everybody? Is this, uh, are we able to continue here or, or do we need to cut it? Well, some people may have to get on the court out at Team Colorado and places, but uh, I'm going to listen to you till you're done because you're, <laughs> we, we got a chance with you right now. We're five minutes shy of eight, so. But there's the buzzer is not going to go off, and you're not going to be booted off or anything. Um, Stephen Pike says keep going. <laughs> All right, no worries. So and I'll be I'm spelling I'll be spelling it. Atul's name here for everybody, so you can you, you can Amazon that thing. Good. And uh, so here I'm going to get into just a you know uh, um, a few thoughts that I want to share with you as it relates to, to this question of nature versus nurture. And if you do a search with my name and, and genetics, uh, you'll find a bunch of links to, to Dan Peterson's interview. And I think it's a fair representation of what was said. And, and so ultimately, the interview boils down to these three questions. And I'll just share with you some thoughts around this uh, so that we can be on the same page and you can at least know where, where I stand on it. Uh, I will say that. Um, in the case of the first question of is it a raw inherited talent or does it take years of dedicated practice, I think in the end at the highest levels of competition uh, there are some basic prerequisite levels of physique or capacity that are consistent with and aligned with the highest levels of performers. Uh, there are certainly exceptions which to me means that genetics are, are not the end-all be-all of top-level performers and, and are certainly not the key differentiators. Ultimately, the, the level here lies in, um, I think, the amount and the type of practice that these individuals undergo. And I, and I will point, uh, and I haven't seen it available, but I'm sure it will be available. Uh, at this MIT conference that I just returned from, there was a session that was actually moderated by Malcolm Gladwell, which uh, addressed this very specifically with a panel of professional coaches, uh, with Mark Verstegen, who's the CEO and founder of Athletes Performance, and with uh, uh, a couple of um, you know exceptionally talented and, and, and uh, uh, much higher name recognition targets than, than you'll find with me. But let's go on to the next slide, John. I'll just kind of start with this. Uh, I began to get really interested in this area um, as an academic area of study and as an applied approach when I came to the USOC and was asked to, to begin talking about feedback and practice design and things like this. And, and to prepare for some of my presentations, I really did uh, a bunch of additional legwork uh, to make sure I had the best of what was available uh, to share. And while the practice design and, and feedback skill acquisition stuff was, was, I was pretty well versed in, one of the things I kept coming across was that among expert level performers, that there were some very different things that they tended to do. And, and these were always kind of peripherally mentioned in these, in these other articles. So I began to just snoop around. And obviously, as, as you probably all know, encountered the name Anders Ericsson and uh, the body of work that has really become associated with him in the area of expertise and expert performance. And these, uh, the first three books on the left here are, are written or edited by Anders directly. Uh, the fourth is, is uh, also edited by him, but really applied more to sport. The, uh, the first three of these are, are very dense, are, are very rich pieces of scientific literature that are, are tough to get through from just kind of a, a lay person standpoint, but they're great sources of information. The Cambridge Handbook on Expertise is, I think, 750 odd pages of cited research. It's really exceptional. It is still considered, I think, the gold standard for this kind of stuff, but um, altogether um, great sources here. Let's go to the next slide, though, because fortunately, I think for all of us, 
that in addition to the more academic research oriented documents, uh, in fact over the past uh, now two or three years we've been fortunate enough to see a number of books pop out that have addressed the very same subject matter but in a far more approachable and digestible way. Uh, Gladwell's Outliers, Matthew Syed's Bounce, Jeff Colvin's Talent is Overrated, and David Schenk's Genius and all of this are four such books that I think tell very compelling stories and very uh, different angles on different aspects of elite and, and outlier level performance. But I will say if it pressed for a favorite, I would go to one other, and John, let's go to the next slide, uh, and that is Dan Coyle's Talent Code. I think Dan's writing style and I think the examples that he uh, brought in and the, the way in which he conveyed the information was I think the most compelling and the most consistently excellent of those previous resources. And if pressed for one to start with, I would certainly steer you this way. Uh, Dan also maintains a blog. He uh, has it here on thetalentcode.com. He is also, uh, he will link to this through Facebook, so if you're on Facebook, you can just uh, search for the talent code and, and like it, and you'll get these automatically, but uh, there's some really terrific articles, and they, they really provide a fresh source and a fresh reminder that ultimately it is uh, not about some natural giftedness necessarily that is the differentiator between those that make it and those that don't, but rather what you do with what you've got. Let's go on here. So this, this whole body of work is ultimately looking at the things that are required for people to get to the very highest levels of achievement. In fact, in Outliers, um, Malcolm Gladwell really makes this distinction well. I mean, we're talking about guys like you know, Bill Gates and the Beatles and those that are in such an outer stratosphere of performance that you know, none of us will have, you know, just one out of a million or, or, or fewer will actually get to these levels. And Erickson lays this kind of thing out pretty clearly in some of his books, and the trajectory kind of looks like this. So if, if we're a performer or if we're a coach and we want to become the expert coach, the, the best coach that ever lived, then our profile of performance would likely follow something like this. We have a, an initial introductory area where we first kind of get interested and we kind of bounce around and we get better because we like it, we just start doing it more. But then in region two, we begin to do more and more. Our, our performance accelerates dramatically. We've, we've really focused some good time into this. Uh, and, and then the, the levels obviously become uh, higher, but the levels in terms of absolute performance, uh, those increments get smaller and smaller and smaller because we're ultimately butting up against those, those levels of human achievement. And at the highest level, we are making, you know, as Erickson states, these eminent contributions to our field, whatever it is. Now, at any one of these levels, it's important to understand that we can be exceptionally good at any of these levels. Uh, we might have uh, a young athlete, a 14s volleyball player that has completely grown into their body and gets it and is tall and lanky and smooth and fluid and strikes the ball well. And they may be exceptionally good among their 14-year-old peers, in fact, may be competitive at 16s and even on some 18s teams. But as the age group shifts up, the requirements of play, the complexities, the speed, those things grow up as well. And ultimately, you know, we, we see that the number of athletes that make it to substantially, uh, sub sequentially higher levels uh, becomes fewer and fewer because the level of what it takes to get there becomes more and more difficult. Let's go on. So this is kind of what we're talking about in terms of um, you know, those performance profiles and the, the steps towards expert level or exceptional level performances. And I, I think, Peter, it's pretty important to remind us all, especially those of us in the grassroots, that in all the research, initial ability does not have anything to do with final ability. Um, even though there are prodigies, 
the there's tons more of, of people that are making NFL or whatever levels who are the Michael Jordan types getting cut when they're 16 or not discovering the sport until they're 15 or 18 and and going on and thriving and and you brought up the Beatles and it made me think that if I'm not mistaken two of the four Beatles their music teachers basically said that they had no musical talent and shouldn't be involved I mean Harrison was one and I think McCartney was the other and at that initial or whatever lower ability they were being dissed by their te by their coaches basically which was kind of remarkable yeah exactly right and uh, the other thing to to remember here is that and, and you know just keeping this slide up is a fine example of it because if you know you take a Beatles or you take Mozart and we've all heard stories of Mozart composing you know concertos or pieces of music when he was you know three or four or five years old well I mean certainly for a three or four or five year old that is a remarkable achievement and not something that we encounter commonly but it's important to remember that those works were not considered masterworks those were not considered eminent contributions to the, uh, the domain of classical music by any standard and and actually that example came up at M MIT and, and Gladwell pointed out that you know, look, it's it's great to recognize that he did some really great stuff when he was really young, but the fact is, if you've ever heard the things that he was composing at three years old, it sounds like a three-year-old was composing it. Uh, it's just, those levels do not translate and, and almost always never correlate to the end level of achievement that an individual can uh, acquire. So the next slide is is kind of the magic number, right? That comes from Erickson's work. Uh, we've all heard it before. It's the ten thousand hour rule. It's the uh, ten years of of deliberate practice. And I think that there are a couple of important things to point out here. One is that um, although Erickson's work has shown, I'll show a couple of examples of this in a moment, that in fact these are the levels that tend to be the ones most indicative of expert level achievement uh, that in fact they aren't necessarily the levels that are required to achieve exceptionally high levels of proficiency and that's simply a, a, a matter of distinction between you know you look at uh, most of the NCAA Division I college volleyball players and they may be very good players but they are not expert, uh, best players in the world kind of players. And so these, these subtle levels of distinction are important, and that is to also recognize that those levels of achievement can be attained in hundreds or thousands of hours uh, rather than this 10,000-hour notion. But I think one of the most important things to lay out here is that uh, Erickson's work is based on this notion of deliberate practice, or, or Dan Coyle actually uses the word deep practice, which I like a lot. Uh, I, I think it sounds cooler, and I think it ultimately gets at what's going on a, a little bit better. Let's go into the next slide. I'll show kind of uh, some evidence from Erickson of, of what this 10,000 hour thing's all about. Um, and I probably should have taken out the animations for this, but you know, here in the, the blue, we, we see that, in fact, if we look at this is a, an analysis of musicians uh, in some of Erickson's earlier work, and, and ultimately he's demonstrating that experts, uh, the, the truest and the best of the experts, are, are those that have accumulated you know, more than 10,000 hours, and that there is a clear distinction of that compared to other levels. And I, I wish you would have chosen a different legend here, because I don't think best experts and good experts and least accomplished experts is actually a, a very good way to express this. Um, but nevertheless, here it is. But here we show that you know we can take a, a, a cross-section at any given age. Let's say we take the 16-year-olds. The and the thing that distinguishes among levels of achievement for this single age group is one thing, and that is the number of accumulated hours of practice. Go to the next slide. One of the things that's interesting about <clears throat> this work, if you now read deeper and you read across 
areas of performance in terms of chess or medicine or mathematics or science or sport is that the type of practice that actually leads to this accumulation is really important. And ultimately, it's not the punching the clock kind of practice time that matters. Punching the clock uh, shouldn't count at all because it doesn't tend to be something that differentiates you in any way from anybody else. This is a study by Ford uh, who tracked a, a bunch of age group soccer players that went through the English Premier League Soccer Academy program. And he, from a very early age, alarmingly so, at, at six years old, tracked a, a cadre of, of players, broke them into groups uh, by where they eventually ended up. So everybody started in the same place. And tracked through interviews with coaches and parents and the athletes themselves, uh, how many hours of, of practice and particularly how many hours of coach-led and non-coach-led practice these athletes experienced. The only thing that differentiated those between those that ultimately earned a professional contract or were offered a professional contract and those that were not, even those that were originally accepted into the Professional Development Academy but were later released, the only thing that separated those were the number of accumulated hours of practice outside of formal practice with the coach. And so Ford and Mark Williams will describe this as street soccer or pickup ball. It's spontaneous play, but it's creative and it's fun and it's fast and it's competitive. Uh, these things were very important. And you know, we can think of examples within our own sport where this kind of thing seemed to be true whether it's you know, Misty May hanging around on the beach with Butch and, and the rest of the group, you know, uh, far older, far better than she ever was, but the number of hours that she accumulated simply by playing, not necessarily being specifically coached in a gym doing block drills, uh, was something that clearly set her apart from others. Let's go on to the next slide. And I, um, I wrote a couple, two or three years ago, a thing about more street volleyball, please, after we you know, got that chance to talk to the, the soccer guys about everything. So it's out there, been out there for a couple of years now. Uh, I'll just share this with you because um, it, as much as I've read and as much I've, as I've thought about this, I still haven't come up with uh, as elegant a way to describe the distinction between kind of the going through the motions practice versus the deep practice as Dan Coyle did in a simple, um, in the simple introduction to his book. And, and John, I, I don't know, I didn't think there was an animation on this, but uh, in his introduction, the title of it is The Girl Who Did a, a Month's Worth of Practice in Six Minutes. And the story that he tells of this, this fictional, uh, fictitiously named uh, music student named Clarissa, to me served as, I think, one of the most concise examples of the distinction between punching the clock kind of practice, even though she was practicing alone, and the kind of effortful, focused, um, error correction detection type of stuff that I've ever read. It was really beautiful. And if you just have a few minutes and can pick up that section alone, I've, I've referred to it many times since. It's a, it's a beautiful way to describe that. The nice thing in that in addition to all these books, we've now also come across a number of examples both in the popular media and other places to help remind us of this stuff. And, and uh, my wife is a huge Oprah Winfrey fan and when she formed her new network, uh, it was on and, and we saw an advertisement come across for a show called Masterclass. And Masterclass is a show that essentially has as a slogan, everybody has a story. And uh, you know, we're going to capture the stories and the lessons from some of the most iconic people on the planet. And the show started, it, it runs on Sunday nights on the OWN channel. And uh, this one was uh, with Jay-Z, who uh, each of these shows is an hour long. The first one was Jay-Z. I think uh, they've had Maya Angelou. They've had Simon Cowell. They've had... Uh, 
uh, Diane Sawyer, they've had others. It, it's a really remarkable series and it's so well done. But Jay-Z's was spectacular in its simplicity of the message and that is, I don't learn anything from success. Everything I learn and everything that I've become has happened as a result of my failures and the, the, the want and the drive that I have to improve upon those. Really spectacular stuff. I encourage you to see it. Let's go to the next one, John. Uh, Tim asks, would effort versus execution be another way to describe this? Uh, well, I think, <laughs> yes, I, I think ultimately going through the motions and just doing the work versus focusing on um, immersing yourself in a problem or a creative solution is, is another. And so, again, this is where it's, it's hard for me to draw an exact definition of the two. I think it's one of those, unfortunately, that you certainly know it when you're going through it. You know when you're just being passive. Uh, I know that anything that I've ultimately had some success at has come because I've really worked my tail off. I've tried to become better. I've tried to do things that ultimately have a bit of risk but ultimately help me learn to become better at something. And by the same token, every time that I've just kind of, you know, either gone through the motions or not really applied myself, uh, my level of achievement in those things has, has reached a, uh, a concomitant level. This is, uh, this is Clint Dempsey, and he plays for Fulham uh, as well as the, the USA. He's a kid from Texas, a small southern border town in Texas where you wouldn't expect necessarily English Premier League capable World Cup level players to come from, uh, but Dempsey did. And I bring this up because, again, there was an excellent example of this and a story that came out of uh, Sports Illustrated right around the time of uh, the 2010 World Cup that described uh, when coaches were described, asked to describe what made Clemsey Clint Dempsey as good as he is, they answered uh, simply that he tries shit. He tries shit that nobody else does, and sometimes that just leads to outright failure and bombing and like, where in the world did that come from? But ultimately, it is the reason that he has been able to be successful at these levels because he's developed moves, he's developed shots, he's developed ways of moving the ball that few people have because that's what he had to do to figure out how to be competitive among um, other more competitive players when he was growing up. Let's go on to the next. I, I'm on a lot of airplanes, uh, the other way, on a lot of airplanes and unfortunately have, have seen far too many movies on airplanes that are horrible, but I was lucky enough once to see a really good one. And I had heard about it, but didn't really know anything about it. Uh, I love music, uh, and I'm very passionate about it. I think that's, that's something that you know, many of us share. But this particular movie is an unbelievable example of expertise. Uh, it Might Get Loud is a documentary that follows, uh, or essentially brings together three iconic guitarists, uh, Jack White, um, the Edge from U2 and uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. And in the process of essentially getting together to talk about their greatness together, uh, they tell a lot of backstories. And it's really remarkable the differences between these people, but also the dramatic similarities in their drive to become exceptional. And The Edge actually says something in this which really has stuck with me. He says that um, there is, oh, when I'm writing or trying to produce a song, there is always a sound in my head that I am trying to create. And I know I may never get there, but the process of trying is what I think has made me successful. It's very powerful, and, and some of the things that Jack White does are simply out of this world. Uh, actually, use your arrow, John, because I think you might get linked to another movie that doesn't exist for you. Go to the next slide. 
I bring up this uh, next band uh, only because they're they're really my absolute favorites, and they they let me tell a story that I like to tell. This is uh, the cover of the album Amnesiac from Radiohead. Radiohead's my favorite band uh, because they're they're very different, they're very eclectic, they're unusual. But uh, the story that I want to tell you here is one that still continues to blow me away. Uh, on this album, they, they wrote a song called Like Spinning Plates. And if you've ever heard the band or, or you've heard this song specifically, you'll notice that it sounds very peculiar as though the lead singer, Tom York, uh, is gurgling or, or they've done something to warp his voice. Uh, the story of this goes is that the band was in the studio recording their previous album, and they had a, a track called I Will, which was slow, kind of depressing, and, and they finished recording it, and their studio engineer was playing it back through their monitors, uh, and it was rewinding, obviously playing backwards at a faster speed, and they really liked the way that it sounded. They thought that the way the beats put together and some of the... the the music just made a very interesting track that they would then decide, well, we'll just actually lay that down as a brand new song, as the foundation for it. And just for kicks, the lead singer decided, you know, if we're going to work off of a backwards soundtrack, I should teach myself how to sing the lyrics backwards. So let's think about kind of the, well, first of all, the weirdness of that, but, but really now think about this from a skill acquisition perspective. And think of a song that you know that's really simple, like Happy Birthday to Me, or even you know, your ABCs, and you know, ABC all the way up to G, and just stop there. And try to teach yourself how to sing that backwards with the correct inflection so that when it's recorded as you sing it backwards, but then played back forward, it would actually sound like the ABC song. It's really complex and it's a really weird thing to think about, but I think of this in the context of skill acquisition and I'm completely blown away. And I can think about this then in the, the context of Clint Dempsey and the willingness to just try shit and, and Jay-Z and just being willing to fail because you wanted to try something to see if you could do it, but in the process learning something dramatically about yourself and the process of creation is really just a remarkable story. Uh, the last slide that I'll leave you with is uh, the next one, and for me, it, it points out kind of all these things together in terms of uh, this nature versus nurture idea. This is, uh, as you might guess, Wayne Gretzky as a kid, and the, the beauty of it is that if you've ever watched Sports Century or you know, these kinds of shows that highlight the career of, of iconic players, you have no doubt come across comments from his coaches or, or former teammates who have said things like, look, he was, he was scrawny, he wasn't really that fast, he really didn't shoot all that great, he wasn't a hard shot at all, uh, he wasn't the most accurate passer that we've ever seen, he wasn't the best puck handler, but yet a guy like this went on to become the most iconic and probably recognized as the best hockey player ever to live in the history of the game and has accumulated obviously all of these accolades and records. And when people try to tie in with Gretzky what made him great or, or ask the question of how did you know you were so talented and how would you know that you've become this person, he said, look, it's not about that at all. You know, I, I skated a lot, I loved it, I had passion for it, I would just try to do things that I thought might be interesting to do. I really wasn't good at it when I was trying it, but I kept at it and I worked at it. And ultimately, the, the line that I like to share here is, is in a lot of the, the Gretzky biographies, he's quoted as saying, the, the highest compliment that you can pay me is to say that I worked hard. And this gets into this notion so much of what it takes to achieve these levels. It doesn't take necessarily a, a God-gifted genetic tool or freak to, uh, to, to be the best. I think it's probably recognized that some 
nominal level of physical ability is, is necessary. You know, Wayne Gretzky wasn't the fastest. He wasn't most aerobically capable. He was just adequately fast, adequately tall, adequately muscled to do the things that he needed to do in the environments that he did them. And he just figured out ways through playing and through competing and through trying uh, that he ultimately rose through the levels to become the greatest ever. So that's really the talk today, and uh, I, I hope to have shared you know some ideas that have caused you to think and can challenge you to to look at how you coach and how you've gone about uh, your work in, in ways that you know ultimately can make yourself and, and the athletes you coach better. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Can't go away yet, buddy. Um, I'm not. Okay. Bruce asks, would you speak to your thoughts on deep practice and how it tends, uh, lends itself to the concept of random practice as it compares to block practice? Yeah, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a, an anecdotal observation on this. Um, I, was, I was working out uh, a year ago in my gym and uh, it was pretty early in the morning, it was probably 6.30, and there was a high school kid in uh, kind of the, the gym area, the, the basketball court area. I was, I was up on a, an elliptical trainer and, and just kind of watching. And 6.30 in the morning, this high school kid is out, and he's playing a game with himself. He's all by himself, and he's got a ball, and he starts off at the free throw line. He shoots a shot, and if he makes it, he runs to get the ball, and he comes back to the line and shoots another free throw if he makes it and he keeps kind of repeating this. But ultimately when he misses, uh, the ball creams off the rim and rather than just kind of walking after it, he aggressively runs after the ball, tries to rebound it, tries to make a shot from where the ball lands, and if he misses that, then it's an additional rebound and an additional shot, and ultimately that continues until he makes the shot and then goes back to the free throw. So, to me, watching this was an amazing example of both random practice and deep practice happening spontaneously and, um, and yet achieving things that were perfectly aligned with both concepts. And so, I, I like very much the, the fact that if you allow someone to explore and design games that are spontaneous and play, I, I for example, when I was setting, uh, I would play a similar game, trying to set a ball from the free throw line, which you know I know you never do, and there wasn't a net there that John Kessel would have been upset by, but you know what, I was trying to work on my precision, and I would try to set the ball in. If I made it, I'd go back to the free throw line. If I missed it, I'd have to set it from wherever it rebounded from, and ultimately, I'm on my back or I'm diving and falling and still trying to use my hands to, to get the ball up. And I know that those are things I probably wouldn't encounter very frequently in games, but in fact what I was doing was to, to surround myself with the variability that I could encounter. And in the process I was becoming more fit. Uh, I was demonstrating whether I knew it or not that I was committed and passionate about getting better. Uh, and I was completely dedicated to error correction. Uh, there's an example, uh, a story of, of Bill, Bill Bradley, uh, professional basketball player and, and former senator, uh, presidential candidate, who famously would be in the gym and would not leave until he hit 25 shots in a row from each of several different spots. And regardless of how far he got, uh, if he got to 24 and then missed, he would start all the way back over. And, and so the sheer amount of determination and practice that had, granted, that was probably examples of blocked practice, but uh, the, the level of commitment and the depth to which he was trying to learn and correct problems on the fly was substantial. I hope Excellent. that answered the question in a way. Um. I don't see any other questions other than Denise asked earlier, how did Dan Jansen overcome 1988? Uh, I don't know how he did it. The fact is he did. And, uh, you know, I was asked once, you know, why, why uh, I wanted to work with the Olympic Committee, and I told him because Dan Jansen got up. 
and the person who asked me actually didn't know who that was. <laughs> and so that was a bit of an awkward moment, but uh, I am, am fundamentally moved by stories of persistence like that. And, and they're all over the Olympic Games, and I think that's one of the reasons that they're, they're such a, a beautiful thing to be a part of. Uh, I don't know ultimately what motivated him to stay with it through those unbelievably trying times and those major catastrophic failures, um, but he did. And uh, ultimately in the end, even though he won one medal, uh, where probably statistically he could have won no fewer than five over the course of the three Olympiad that he competed in, uh, some might look at that as saying, "What a what a failure! What a you know what a waste of, of potential there." But in fact, it wasn't at all. It was exactly the reason so many of us loved the Olympics, and that was it was just a beautiful display of of the the sheer willpower and and human effort. Peter, um, <laughs> Kaylin over at Team Colorado would like to know why there's a banana on the step. <laughs> That's a good question. Why do you think there's a banana on the step? <laughs> I don't know if they can type the answer in fast enough. Um, normally, sometimes we've ended these uh, things with the myth stuff, of course, with the generating a leap of faith while the guy jumps off whatever cliff. Ah, Sarah thinks it's because bad things happen. That's right. And and ultimately, you know, looking at something like this and, and realizing that course the the joke of you know slipping on a banana peel uh, kind of motivated me to um, to present this one of the original titles of the slide that I or the presentation that I ended up coming uh, uh, walking away from was on the edge of human achievement watch out for the bananas but uh, I decided to go with a little different route but in the end it's it's that something like this can be an obvious source of a major accident, a, a catastrophic slip or fall. We know it, we see it, the question is will we do anything about it? Will we clear this, the steps of ice uh, and snow? Will we clear the steps of the banana peel or we, we continue to walk on them and just kind of walk carefully? If we fell, if we slipped on the banana peel knowing it was there, then we you know, would clearly attribute that mistake to ourselves. Well, and I would... I would say, Peter, you know, um, in our sport, we, well, I know that working with you for a long time, we do a lot of what-ifs as we prepare the Olympic team and do the team leader things, and and in that what-ifs, you know, we attempt to create a lot of bad scenarios, but our sport was able to, uh, you know, see that very clearly um, with the remarkable way the players were empowered by Hugh McCutcheon throughout the training and, you know, the training that they had with Doug Beal leading up to that as well, such that when the tragedy occurred to Hugh, the team was able to maintain. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, you know, that's, that's a good example. I'm glad you brought that up, John. That's actually something that I'm speaking to uh, the professional team, uh, basketball team about now, is that they are likely to shore up a playoff spot. In fact, they're likely to lock in the spot that they're um, – they're honing in on right now fairly early. And so the question then is, can you introduce, use essentially the time between when you know you've got your spot locked up and, and the rest of the regular season, can you use that as opportunity to introduce some, um, some additional stress and, and use those as learning moments to ask, how would you handle this? And those kinds of things, I think, can be manufactured in pretty effective ways, whether you're a club coach or whether you're a collegiate or, or professional or Olympic coach. There are situations that learning from history and learning that mistakes happen because things aren't handled well can be exceptional learning points if you allow them to be. And you know, whether, for example, we, we, we manufacture a, a front page of a USA Today and throw it in the training room that says that the star athlete is, is you know, now likely going to miss uh, the first few games of the playoff because of a, a bone spur. You know, whether we're that cruel or not, I don't know, but the fact is if we can introduce some source of conflict or stress but use it as a teaching moment, 
uh, as a way to avoid catastrophic failure should something like that actually then happen uh, can be a an effective way to essentially simulate possible bad outcomes before they happen and address ways to mitigate those. No other questions have come in. We've taken up more than I told you we would take up of your time. Um, as always, Peter, beyond excellent. Uh, you know, the Olympic Committee and volleyball is lucky to have you being part of the program for sure. Um, you know, you see how to reach us all. We're all first name dot last name at usoc.org if you're talking to the Olympic Committee people and usav.org for USA Volleyball. Thanks a million. Um, everybody's saying thank yous in the uh, question and chat box. So great job, Peter, and enjoy the rest of your evening all. And we'll be uh, doing a webinar on March 16th. Um, same time, same bat station on uh, reading and another one on uh, Fundamental Volleyball 2. We've got uh, Fundamental Volleyball is on um, Level 2 will be on March 16th at 7 p.m. So you'll get some information out. And uh, thanks, everybody, and good evening. Thanks, everyone.